Welcome to CB8 Speaks. My name is Ellen Pallavi, and I'm a Community Board 8 Manhattan member. Today, we are meeting with Senator Jose M. Serrano, and I'm so pleased to have you here. Senator Serrano, a lifelong South Bronx resident, was elected to the New York State Senate in November of 2004. He is the chair of the Senate Democratic Conference and serves as the ranking member of the Senate Committee for Cultural Affairs, Tourism, Parks and Recreation, as well as Civil Service and Pensions. His other committee assignments include aging, agriculture, consumer protections, libraries, cities, science, technology, incubation and entrepreneurship. That's quite a lot to bite off. Formerly a city council member during the city fiscal crisis, he was an outspoken proponent for the arts, libraries, and cultural institutions. Senator Serrano fought successfully to restore millions of dollars to maintain the New York City Library and to restore 40 million for cultural organizations. In 2004, Senator Serrano was elected to the New York State Senate. He represents what is now the 29th Senate District. His district has perhaps the greatest socioeconomic and cultural diversity in the state, including neighborhoods in the South and West Bronx, East Harlem, Upper Yorkville, Roosevelt Island, Central Park, and the Upper West Side. Senator Serrano has introduced a wide variety of bills championing the arts, keeping housing affordable, protecting public health, fostering economic development, defending immigrant rights, closing the income inequality gap, and preserving the environment. We are lucky to have you, Senator Serrano, and thank you for being here. My pleasure. So with such a diverse area that to cover, that's amazing. Mm -hmm. How do you reach out to everybody? Well, first, I want to thank you, Alan, for uh, having me on the show, and it's always such a pleasure. I've known you for years, and it really is wonderful to be here. Even though I have a bit of laryngitis, I'm uh, very happy to have the opportunity to talk about uh, the things that we've been working on uh, in the State Senate and in the district. First and foremost, I give uh, the utmost credit to a wonderful staff that I have, a, a bunch of uh, uh, wonderful, energetic individuals who care deeply about the constituents that we serve. And um, we <clears throat> engage our community by holding constituent hours in different various neighborhoods throughout our district every day. So for instance, we'll be on Roosevelt Island on Wednesdays. We'll be in uh, Yorkville on Mondays. <clears throat> so we're able to bring our constituency to local library, to our constituent services to local libraries, senior centers, uh, and uh, other sort of government uh, offices where the constituents don't have to travel all the way to our district office, which is in East Harlem. Instead, they can uh, engage our, our constituent staff uh, in, on a much local, much more local basis. I want to point out to everybody that one of the, the great productions from Senator Serrano's staff is a newsletter that's being sent out to everybody. And I'm, I'd like to tell people how to receive this. If you'd mm -hmm. like to find out what's going on in Albany, mm -hmm. this will tell you. And we put together a monthly report. Then we, we tend to focus on different areas of, of critical importance. We'll take a month where we'll focus on senior services. We'll do another month focusing on uh, housing and affordable housing, know your rights. Uh, we'll take another month to focus on women's issues and legal services and uh, health care and such. And uh, every month uh, we will be at uh, our local community boards, at precinct council meetings, at public venues, uh, distributing our information and also giving constituents the opportunity to engage us in that, in that regard. So we hand out our information, we disseminate it uh, pretty widely using social media, using email. Uh, but again, if there's uh, any constituent who would like to learn more about the things that we're working on, they could feel free to call my office and we will be more than happy to email this report to anyone. Now, there's been a lot of, a lot of question about what's going to happen to immigrants these days. Well, Ellen, it really is such a shame hearing the uh, amount of uh, negative rhetoric coming out of Washington under this new administration. There is a tremendous amount of trepidation within the immigrant community, uh, and, and quite frankly, uh, even folks who aren't in the immigrant community are very concerned about this erosion of uh, the American ideal, being that we are a nation 
of immigrants, of uh, uh, a nation who has for generations and for, for hundreds of years welcomed uh, those fleeing <clears throat> the type of oppression uh, in their home country that we sought to change. And unfortunately, under this new president, uh, we're hearing a lot of negativity and, uh, and uh, sort of uh, very negative warnings to the immigrant community that their situation is in peril. What I've done in the state Senate is I've introduced legislation called the Liberty Act. The Liberty Act will uh, ensure that we as a state are a sanctuary state uh, beyond just New York City being a sanctuary city, the entire state being a place where law enforcement is not allowed to inquire about a person's immigration status, unless, of course, the individual is, is, is engaged in a violent felony. Uh, it will ensure that uh, folks are not stopped by law enforcement just solely on suspicion of immigration status. And by doing so, I believe we create safer communities because we ensure that immigrants are not in the shadows, that they come forward, that they report crime when they've been the victim of crime. Oftentimes, I hear uh, very tragic stories of immigrants who uh, themselves are victims of domestic violence or workplace abuse, and they won't come forward to authorities for fear of having to answer tough questions about their immigration status. Uh, and oftentimes, crimes will go unreported. So my belief is that this legislation will help inspire confidence within the immigrant community to step out of the shadows, to become greater parts of American society, and also ensuring uh, that the American dream, the American ideal of welcoming, law-abiding uh, new immigrants uh, to these shores is not further eroded. I think New York State has to send a very strong message to Washington and to the rest of the nation that we stand for uh, liberty, that we stand for the American ideals as outlined by, uh, by our forefathers and by our Constitution. Do you think that this will pass? My hope is that this bill uh, will step out of the realm of the usual partisan politics. I think a lot of great ideas have fall, fallen victim to partisan politics, not just in, in New York, uh, but in Washington. And, uh, you know, I like to use as examples the arts and culture and state parks. Uh, when I rise in the State Senate to talk about the importance of preserving arts and education, the arts and culture, or state parks, I generally have universal support from Republicans, from uh, Democrats, who believe that this is no longer a wedge issue, that these are issues of importance, regardless of your political persuasion. Uh, unfortunately, immigration, under this, uh, this previous campaign and even long before, uh, many have used it as a wedge issue, uh, especially in, the, uh, in those of conservative ideology. And it's very unfortunate because immigration, frankly, has touched every single family, regardless of your political ideology. Uh, no one among us uh, was, uh, was here, uh, aside from Native Americans. Uh, and it's really important to remember that we were a nation built on immigration, uh, built on the hard work and ingenuity and passion of the immigrant community, and nothing has changed uh, from that point of view. Uh, and we need to move the discussion away from partisan wedge issue and make it about, look, this is something that we can all relate to. Let's put aside our political labels. Let's focus on the Liberty Act as something that we all should get behind for the betterment of our communities, for the safety of our communities, and let's vote on it and let's pass it. It already passed the Assembly. My hope is that it will pass the Senate quite soon. You believe that you can get consensus for this? It is a multi-pronged approach to doing that. And I think the, speaking about it publicly, conversing with my colleagues, uh, I approach it the way I've approached uh, everything that I have in my 16, 16 years as an elected official, which is to build consensus. Uh, we cannot function as a representative government if we don't learn how to build consensus around issues and how to build coalitions. Uh, coalitions of people who care deeply about our society. I'm, I'm less concerned about political victories, uh, and everyone knows that about me. I, I really am concerned 
but finding ways to reach across the aisle, uh, to work with my colleagues, regardless of their political persuasion, and let them know, hey, this is something that is not a Democratic issue or a Republican issue. Whether you represent a district in upstate New York or out on Long Island or in the South Bronx, there are immigrant communities who can tell very similar stories about how they came to America, why they chose New York, because they know New York has a long history of welcoming and nurturing the immigrant community. And look at the long history we have of immigrants who've come uh, to these shores with very little, uh, with very little money, and have created uh, a tremendous amount of uh, the American dream for themselves, for their children, gone on to do great things, and made this country a better place. So you, when you talked about reaching across the aisle and building, building coalitions, we, do you also include the <clears throat> public in that? I think that we can't properly govern unless there is consensus among the public uh, about an issue that is of critical importance. And I've seen throughout my career in public office that when the public gets very excited about something and they become very vocal, it does change policy. I'll give you a good example. I think it was back in 2009, uh, there was a budget proposal by the then governor to close 91 state parks throughout the state of New York to try to fill a budget shortfall. I was totally against it because I understand how important our state parks are, not only for our health and well-being, but they also serve as an economic catalyst in communities throughout the state. There was such <clears throat> outpouring of um, of uh, anger at this proposal. Facebook groups were set up by local community groups and resident organizations from all over the state. They started with just a few folks and then numbered into thousands. And they let their voices be heard. And suddenly we had real movement on both sides of the aisle to tackle this issue. Before you know it, the proposal to close 91 state parks was completely el eliminated. Now that's not my victory. That's the victory of the community who became so galvanized around the issue. So we can do this on any issue that we want, uh, any issue that we feel is of the utmost importance. So long as it's in the mindset of creating a better, a better society for the greater good and that it moves sort of the ball forward uh, in progress in our communities. People have <clears throat> been calling their elected officials, writing, mm -hmm. emailing, mm -hmm. going down to the office, petitioning outside of an elected official's office. Is mm -hmm. that what you're saying would work for, for Albany? Yeah, and it does happen. I mean, every week when I go up to Albany, uh, there's different groups coming in by the busload. Uh, they left 5 a.m. in the morning from the places like the Bronx or East Harlem, and they come up. Um, weary, uh, weary-eyed and, and tired, but uh, really excited about conveying the issue that they care so deeply about. And we do take notice. We know, at least I do, and, and I know many of my colleagues feel the same way, that I'm only a state senator because my community put me there. Uh, they elected me, and every two years I have to go back to the community and ask for my job again. And they reelect me in a, in a district that is easily uh, the most diverse Senate district anywhere in the state. You mentioned all the different neighborhoods. Uh, I have, uh, I believe my district is the most diverse racially and ethically, but also economically. And uh, it gives me a better understanding being able to listen to all these various groups and neighborhoods. I get such a wealth of opinion from different places. There's a lot of common threads throughout all of these neighborhoods. They care very deeply about affordable housing. They care deeply about good schools. They care deeply about public health. So there's much more that uh, binds us than divides us. Uh, but I, again, I believe that that level of activism uh, makes my job easier. It gives me a clearer understanding of what my community expects from me. And that's what drives what I do. I, don't, I follow an agenda that's given to me and based on the concerns uh, of my constituents. I understand that there's three Conf conferences, mm -hmm. which are political parties, and two of them, one is Republican, one is Democrat, and then there's a third, mm -hmm. which, are, which con is consisting of Democrats that have become independent. 
That actually means that the Democrats can't form a coalition and and produce automatically mm -hmm. produce a democratic a democratic vision in Albany. Mm -hmm. Is there something that the voting public could do to encourage those Democrats? It's an interesting question, and I, and unfortunately, there's no easy answers. Uh, you know, I would love to see. Um, all Democrats united uh, in the in the state Senate, but as I mentioned before, uh, my style has been more to focus on the issues uh, and less on the political differences that uh, people are facing. And I think that is what the public want to hear more about. Um, they want to hear less about what divides us and more about what we can do to work together on a specific issue. I think with the new administration in Washington, there is a heightened sense of urgency to get things done quickly. Um, only four weeks into the new administration, and there's already a tremendous amount of fear and anxiety that I see in the faces and I hear in the voices of my constituents. Uh, immigrant communities wondering if they'll be able to be here tomorrow. Uh, women's uh, concerns about their health decisions and reproductive rights. Um, ensuring that we have real uh, uh, investment in public education. These are the issues that the public, I think, is much more concerned about. Um, if we drive those issues forward, uh, I believe that we will be able to build the level of consensus within our, our, uh, our legislative body to pass those bills. And, and those, I, those issues, I believe, ultimately will unite us. With the appointment of uh, Betsy DeVos as education secretary, now there's a concern that money will come away from public schools and be put into private for-profit schools. How will that affect New York State? I'm deeply troubled by uh, Betsy DeVos. Uh, her new uh, appointment, I think, sends a very uh, strong chilling effect on those of us who care deeply about public education. You know, the bottom line is, is that over 90 percent of the students um, attend uh, public schools, uh, not just in my community, but throughout the city of New York. And there's long been struggles within our public schools, but I still think they provide the best hope uh, for betterment within our community, for eventual economic prosperity within our community. And we need to find new and innovative ways to educate our children and to ensure that teachers are able to uh, work with parents uh, in making sure that our students receive the best education. I believe a very strong commitment should be made by elected officials from the federal level through the state level in ensuring that public education uh, is given the utmost priority. Uh, this should not be, again, this should not be a wedge issue. I find it um, really so unfortunate when uh, children find themselves in the middle of a political wedge discussion about education. It's ridiculous. We need to get past that. We need to ensure that we're focusing on the needs of our children, especially those who are most vulnerable, those who uh, have the least economic advantages, uh, who can't afford the expensive tutors, uh, making sure that they get the quality education. Um, uh, that will allow them to move forward as a, as a, and become the next wave of elected officials and help shape policy in our community. What will happen to the money that comes in from the federal government? It's really hard to say. We've been <clears throat> seeing an unfortunate, a fortunate amount of turmoil out of Washington now, and it's very hard to understand or know um, what the concrete policies will be. That has created layer upon layer of anxiety whether it be on the national level, state government, and local governments, because so much of what we do depends on federal funding. Um, so I hear artists tell me all the time, federal funding for the arts may disappear. It's hard to know if that will happen or not. Uh, on, the, on the education level, it's very hard to know what policies will be put in place that will affect funding on a local level. All I can say is that from our point of view, as state elected officials, we must, I believe, double down on our commitment to public education to ensure that we have robust schools within our communities, 
that we have new school construction, that we have state-of-the-art facilities, and that we have real engagement with parents and families to ensure that they are strong partners in the education programs. Um, so, you know, as a parent with two small children, I, I understand how important the parental role is, but nothing can substitute the fact that we also need uh, uh, strong federal commitment and federal dollars to our public education system. What happens to the health care system in New York? Another le level of trepidation uh, is in that, because we are unsure of what the unknowns are. Uh, our new president uh, said that on day one he would repeal and replace uh, Obamacare, otherwise known as the Affordable Care Act. Um, as of today, we have not seen what the replacement will be. So <clears throat> there are many town hall meetings happening throughout the country where people who have um, come to rely on the Affordable Care Act for health coverage are wondering what's next. If you're saying you're going to take it away, what will be there for us? So unfortunately, Ellen, I don't know the answer. Um, I think that there is a lot of worry amongst people, uh, families, uh, individuals who have, uh, who have used the Affordable Care Act. Um, and I find it very unfortunate that instead of finding ways to improve it and make it more affordable and more accessible, this rhetoric to repeal it, simply because it was a product of President Obama, and talk about re replacing it with some unknown, uh, I think has done nothing more than create a chilling effect on uh, the healthcare system. And it makes it very hard for people who are dealing with pre existing conditions. Our unfortunate people, as they grow older, have other health issues that we should stand behind and make sure that people are treated well so that they can have better medical outcomes. I think we need to see strong direction from the federal government. In the meantime, I think the state should do all that it can to make sure that local uh, health care, uh, local clinics, local hospitals are really providing a safety net for those, uh, the poor, for those who could least afford uh, health care. If we don't have this, the federal money that goes to Medicaid, what will happen to our Medicaid system in New York? Is something going to have to change? Uh, that's another example of something that has become a partisan issue when initially it wasn't. When Medicaid was initially uh, put forward, it was supported by Democrats and Republicans alike who understood that poverty knows no race, knows no political persuasion, and that Medicaid provided a safety net that in the long term actually saved money by making sure that our most vulnerable remained healthy and did not have to go to emergency rooms for primary health care and things of that nature. Unfortunately, over the years, we've seen <clears throat> many use Medicaid and Medicare in some instances as a us against them issue, calling them entitlement programs, when in actually they are part of the public good that we all pay into and that we all care deeply about because it provides a safety net that if, uh, if any of us uh, needed, uh, it would be there for them. Um, my hope is that those who are in opposition to the enhancements in Medicaid that have provided so much benefit to our community understand that their communities, maybe they should tour their districts or their part of the country and see that that level of poverty that they think is only contained in the inner cities is actually even more profound in rural America. Uh, rural America is suffering. Uh, they're very much in need of health care. They're very much in need of strong schools. And all of these programs that they believe are only benefiting the inner cities, really, they should take a long, hard look at their own backyards because it is protecting their constituents and they should not turn their back on these programs. I'd like to find out about affordable housing. Uh, do, you, I, do you have any affordable, <clears throat> uh, any creative approaches? Over the last 10, 15 years, we've lost so much Michelama housing. Michelama being, I think, a very solid idea many years ago to create uh, affordable housing for working families. And there was a sunset in the provision and we had a certain amount of time uh, in order to come up with a Michelama 2.0, and unfortunately no one did come up with this program with a, a, a sort of a reboot. And we saw a lot of Michelama phasing out, uh, and there was no uh, 
there was no replacement for it. And, uh, you know, some buildings remained affordable, but some didn't. And uh, what that has meant is that there's been a further squeezing of the affordable housing stock uh, in New York City and New York State in such a way that New York City is increasingly becoming a city where only the wealthy can afford to live. Meanwhile, our seniors and our uh, working families who are trying to get by are finding it harder to stay in New York City. Uh, I have a bill in the state Senate that would repeal what's called the vacancy bonus. <clears throat> vacancy bonus is when a rent-regulated apartment becomes vacant uh, and in between leases or when the landlord uh, sets up a new lease, they increase the rent by 20%. So whenever there's a turnover of that apartment, there's a potentially a 20% increase over the previous lease. Now, <clears throat> what that does is it moves uh, that apartment very quickly into deregulation. And at that point, it's no longer part of the affordable housing stock. Uh, and you're seeing that happen week after week, year after year in our communities where we're losing what little affordable housing we have. Uh, my hope is that this legislation will pass, that my bill to repeal the vacancy bonus will pass, uh, and that it will gain the universal support that's needed because, again, it affects Democrat and Republican districts alike. Thank you. I wanted to point out that you're doing some great work on public health with mm -hmm. uh, asthma. Mm -hmm. In one sentence, <clears throat> uh, could you tell us what is going on with that? We are community in the South Bronx and East Harlem, but actually throughout CB8, uh, has uh, higher instances on level of, in, of uh, hypertension and diabetes and asthma. And uh, there's many different reasons why that's happening. Access to green space, uh, to healthy foods, as we've discussed in the past, to quality health care uh, to help avoid some of these problems, uh, childhood obesity. But we have some issues that uh, I think are, are critical of the here and now, of just the other day, yesterday, there was a report of a bacteria that was infecting uh, residents in the South Bronx that was uh, spread th from rat urine, uh, leptospirosis. And it's a hot topic in the news. And it's amazing that in this day and age, I mean, we're not talking about hundreds of years ago, so we're talking about now, that they can be pathogens that are being spread by rats. And I think it's really important that as a city we ensure that building owners are making sure that there is uh, pest control, that there aren't rats in people's apartments and they aren't spreading disease. Uh, but aside from that, I think we have uh, bigger issues on health disparities and making sure that we, uh, that there is primary health care, uh, affordable health care in communities that are most vulnerable to ensure that we have a healthy population. Senator Jose Serrano, mm -hmm. you're doing a great job spanning the Upper East Side mm -hmm. and the, the people who have the most wealth and people who have the least wealth. And you're touching upon issues that affect everybody. Mm -hmm. And Senator Serrano, thank you for being here. And thank you for tuning in. See you next time. <laughs>